Count one, malice murder. We, the jury, find the defendant, Travis McMichael, guilty. Oh. I'm going to ask that whoever just made an outburst be removed from the court, please. As this court has indicated, I ask that there be no outbursts in the court, and I expect as much from the gallery. That is not me. That is not me. That is not him. That is not him. I would never walk up to you and say those words to you. I'm so sorry that that happened to you. At one point, a grieving family member rushing forward, trying to reach the gunman seated at the defense table, court officers jumping in to hurry the gunman away. Everyone, no matter what the color of their skin may be, deserves to be treated with dignity and respect. They deserve as much of a fair chance at finding happiness and success in life as anyone else. But tragically, not everyone sees things this way. Some people use the color of others' skin as a reason to hate them. Some people even use it as a reason to hurt or kill them. Racism can destroy communities, divide people, and ruin lives. While progress has been made at spreading awareness and education about tolerance and kindness, there is still a long way that society has to go. One thing is certain. If someone goes out of their way to try to hurt someone because of their race, it's going to come back to bite them in one way or another. That is what racists in this video found out. They thought they would get away with their heartless actions, but ended up getting served sentences that they would have never expected. One of the most painful chapters in East Texas history is moving towards closure now more than 20 years later. John William King is set to be executed tonight in Huntsville, convicted of a gruesome murder that many have called a modern day lynching. This is a story that is so horrific that it is impossible that anyone who was alive at the time it occurred and heard about it could ever forget it. Back in 1998, King, an avowed racist, chained James Byrd Jr. to the back of a truck and dragged him along a road outside Jasper. For Texas. Sean Barry, Lawrence Brewer, and John William King were all racists and white supremacists. On June 7, 1998, James Byrd Jr., a 49-year-old black man, accepted a ride from Sean Barry, who was 23, Lawrence Brewer, who was 31, and John David King, who was 23. John was the one behind the wheel. James had no idea that when accepting what he thought was just an act of kindness, he would soon be facing incredible torture and eventual death. James did know John from around town, although not well. He surely could not have imagined what this man was truly capable of. The men had told James that they were going to give him a ride home. But instead, they drove him to a secluded area of town and did unspeakable things to him that no human should ever have to experience. After they were done, they tied James to the back of a pickup truck and dragged him for three miles. It is believed that he was alive and conscious for about half of the time. The three evil men would later gather his severely damaged body outside of an African-American cemetery. One part of his body was dumped outside a black church. They then went to a barbecue as if nothing happened. A motorist discovered the remains the following day and alerted the authorities. Law enforcement looked over the area where they believed the murder occurred and found a wrench with the name Barry written on it. They also found a lighter with the word possum on it. Possum was John's nickname. Tragically, not all of James's remains were even collected by his killers. They were scattered over a stretch of miles. It did not take long for law enforcement to suspect John and Lawrence because it was well known throughout town that they were white supremacists. John even had several racist tattoos on his body. The wrench would also help bring Sean into suspicion. All three men were tried and later convicted of the murder. Sean received life in prison with the possibility of parole in 2038. He will be 68 years old at the time and will have spent most of his life behind bars. Both John and Lawrence were ordered to pay for their evil crimes with their lives. John's death occurred in April 2019. He's an animal. I don't think you can learn to do this to a human being. James's sister remembered her brother for his love of music. He had always hoped to make a name for himself through his talent. Unfortunately, he never had the chance. Hate is a lack of education, and you're not born to hate. James Byrd's death led to new hate crime legislation at both the state and federal level. The city named a park after him, and the Byrd family set up a foundation dedicated to multicultural understanding. Lawrence Brewer's death occurred on September 21st, 2011. 
Before he died, he gloated about having to die rather than spend the rest of his life in prison, which was the easy way out, and he was happy it was going to happen. Lawrence was given the option to request a last meal, and he took advantage of it in a pretty disgusting way by ordering an extremely long list of food. This included two chicken fried steaks with gravy, a cheese omelet with a bunch of different ingredients, a meat lover's pizza, a pound of barbecue meat, a loaf of bread, fajitas, ice ice cream, and three root beers. After the chef finished preparing the meal and presented it to him, Lawrence then said he wasn't hungry and all of the food was thrown out. After that, it was determined that last meal requests would no longer be accepted. The community of East Texas will never forget the evil acts that were committed by these three horrible men. to that deadly shooting spree in California. A suspect is in custody this morning, accused of killing three white men because of their race. Corey Muhammad hated white people and wanted to do anything he could to hurt them. In April 2017 in Fresno, California, he killed three white men just because of the color of their skin. None of the victims were armed. After the murders, a manhunt took place. Corey had to run to a nearby 7-Eleven and hid on the roof. He watched from above as detectives combed the area looking for the suspect. After they left, he came down and hid in a dumpster outside of a local school. He cut his hair in hopes of disguising his appearance. Luckily, someone who was nearby during the murders had recognized Corey and was also able to identify him to law enforcement. He was later arrested. Corey said that on the day of the murders, his goal had been to go out and kill as many white people as possible. The murders were categorized as a hate crime. He was ultimately convicted and sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole. He never expressed any remorse for what he did. Prior to his sentencing, family members of the victims were given the opportunity to speak out on their loved one's behalf. But before they could say anything, Corey spoke out and told the judge that if any of the family members addressed him, he would constantly interrupt them with outbursts. This led to him being removed from the courtroom. He's a coward. He's an evil coward. That's why he didn't want to hear what we had to say. Party. Douglas County prosecutors say Norton was not one of the writers who pointed guns at the adults and children in the yard of the Douglasville home. But David Amati says she was among many who hurled menacing threats while yelling the N-word. In July 2015, a black family from Georgia was trying to celebrate a little girl's ninth birthday. Kayla Norton and Jose Torres, a racist white couple, decided to ruin the party by driving by, waving Confederate flags, and yelling racial slurs to try to intimidate the family. They were armed at the time. The couple was later identified and arrested. The news of the people who went out of their way to try to ruin a little kid's birthday party out of pure hate spread anger throughout the country, and many demanded that justice be served. While in court, Kayla was very emotional. She turned to her victims and apologized for her actions, saying that what she did did not reflect the kind of woman she was. That is not me. That is not me. That's not him. To many of the victims, especially those who had children who were present at that party who had to witness this, her apology was way too little and too late. The damage had already been done. The judge, clearly fed up with the racist couple's actions, ended up giving them both more prison time than either one of them were expecting. Jose Torres and Kayla Norton, in tears most of the hearing, were each given a year longer in prison than the state even was seeking, 13 years for Torres, six for Norton. The judge called their actions a hate crime and racially motivated. As if what they did couldn't be even more sickening, both Joel and Kayla happened to be parents. In fact, they have three children between them. Clearly, this is about as bad of an example that you can set for young kids. Well, new tonight, a racist killer's jailhouse confession. His words could bring down other members of the KKK. We talked to a former inmate who has documents from Edgar Ray Killen. 
In them, Killen implicates others in the infamous 1964 killing of three civil rights workers. Edgar Ray Killen was a former leader of the KKK, and he was convicted for his role in taking the lives of James Cheney, Andrew Goodman, and Michael Schwerner in the summer of 1964 in Mississippi. The three men had traveled to the area to participate in something that was called the Summer of Freedom. Part of the goal of the initiative was to get black people registered to vote. These civil rights workers' deaths were especially cruel and disturbing. The murders occurred after they were pulled over while driving. Edgar was not actually arrested for his part in the killings until 2005, and he was 80 years old by the time the case went to trial. While he was convicted for only three counts of manslaughter, it is believed that he likely claimed way more lives than just that. In fact, he even admitted to it. He confessed to, of all people, a black man who was a fellow inmate in prison at the time. His name was James Stern. Mr. Killen, do you have any comments? It's hard to believe that a convicted member of the KKK would tell his story to a black man. But after a year in the state prison system, locked up in the same medical ward as Edgar Ray Killen, James Stern claims he became Killen's confidant. James Stern, after being released from prison, would later tell the press that there were 32 cold cases of murder that Edgar confessed to being a part of. Edgar was sentenced to 60 years behind bars, which, considering his age, was essentially a life sentence for him. He died in 2018 at the age of 92. This tragedy occurred in February of 2020. Travis McMichael, along with his father, Gregory McMichael, and another man named William Roderick Bryan Jr., chased and eventually killed a 25-year-old unarmed black man named Ahmad Aubrey. Ahmad had simply been taking a jog through a local neighborhood for exercise when his killers assumed he was a burglar and attacked him. Just days before the murder occurred, Travis had called 911 to report a black man who he believed was trespassing near a house that was under construction. This is the 911 phone call he made. What did he look like? Uh, it's a black male, red shirt, white shorts. Are you okay? Yeah, yeah, when I, it just startled me. Um, when I turned around, when I turned around and saw him and backed up, he reached into his pocket and ran into the house. So I don't know if he's armed or not. Travis believed that Ahmad was the same man. The three killers were friendly with the law enforcement in town where the murder occurred, which is likely why it took months for them to be arrested and charged with murder. Their arrests occurred after a cell phone video from the day of the murder was released and began circulating online. It infuriated many and led the country to call for justice to be served. My son was not committing a crime. He was out for his daily jog and he was hunted down like an animal and killed. All three men pleaded not guilty to murder. It was a a lengthy and controversial trial that led to all three men being convicted. Count one, malice murder. We, the jury, find the defendant, Travis McMichael, guilty. Oh. I'm gonna ask that whoever just made an outburst be removed from the court, please. While all three men played a role in the murder, some believe that Travis was likely the biggest instigator. He was the one to first spot Ahmad, and he was the one who assumed the innocent man was guilty of something. The others just followed his lead. After sentencing, Ahmad's mother, Wanda Cooper, spoke out. She addressed her deceased son and asked the judge to have no mercy on his killers. Son, I love you as much today as I did today that you were born. Raising you was the honor of my life, and I'm very proud of you. Your honor, these men have chose to lie and attack my son and his surviving family. They each have no remorse and do not deserve any leniency. The judge agreed with Wanda and did as she requested, locking Travis up and throwing away the key. Travis was sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole. His father received the same sentence. William received life in prison with the possibility of parole after 30 years. The judge had this to say at the sentencing. A resident of Glynn County, a graduate of Brunswick High, a son, a brother, a young man with dreams was gunned down in this community. 
As we understand it, he left his home apparently to go for a run, and he ended up running for his life. Ahmad's murder led to further conversations throughout the United States, calling for an end to racism, hate, and violence. This day, as we stand before this courthouse, I thought this day would never come. We knew our boy would, and we kept searching for after him. But guess what? It's God. We didn't give up. And we begin with the emotional hearing in a Buffalo courtroom. The white supremacists who killed 10 black people at a neighborhood supermarket last May, hearing from the families of his victims, confronting him with their pain and anger before he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. On May 14th, 2022, the United States and particularly the Buffalo, New York community experienced an unthinkable tragedy. Then 18 year old racist and white supremacist Peyton Genrod, armed with a weapon he should have never had access to in the first place, walked into a grocery store called Topps Family Supermarket. While live streaming the entire thing, he took the lives of 10 people and injured three more. All of the victims who died were black. Before entering the store to carry out the her, he said to the live stream, just gotta go for it. While he was killing people, he was also yelling out racial slurs. Employees of the store helped to hide customers by locking them in the break rooms in the back. Others hid in the milk coolers. Peyton tried firing his weapon at them, but the milk coolers blocked the bullets from hitting them. Law enforcement were able to arrive on the scene quickly. By that point, Peyton was at the front of the building and threatening to turn the weapon on himself, but officers were able to convince him to drop it. Peyton was immediately arrested and taken into custody custody. After his arrest, he admitted that he did this because he intentionally wanted to kill black people. He even drove three and a half hours from his home because he purposely wanted to target an area where he knew a lot of black people would be. Prior to the incident, he planned things out carefully by purchasing lots of ammo and researching other hate crimes and attacks. He was charged with first degree murder and initially pleaded not guilty. He changed his plea to guilty on all counts later that year in order to avoid the possibility of having to pay with his life. As you can imagine, the court proceedings in this case were extremely heated. And at one point, a loved one of the victims even tried to take matters into his own hands. At one point, a grieving family member rushing forward, trying to reach the gunman seated at the defense table court officers jumping in to hurry the gunman away. Family members of the victims had the opportunity to speak on the behalf of their loved ones. Their anger and pain was evident. Tonight, the pain of that racist attack at a Buffalo supermarket roared into court as families of the 10 black men and women dead faced their loved one's killer. Wayne Jones took the stand to remember his beloved mother who was killed at age 65. Her name was Celestine Chani. While I was writing this, Tears fell from my eyes. Thinking about what a beautiful person you took. Peyton also had the opportunity to address the court and he apologized for his actions. I'm very sorry for all the pain I forced the victims and their families to suffer through. I'm very sorry for stealing the lives of your loved ones. I cannot express how much I regret all the decisions I made leading up to my actions on May 14th. He said that he acted out of hate and wished he could take back what he did. That hate comes from things he read online and chose to believe. He also said that he hopes no one else out there will be inspired by his actions and do anything else like this. The judge did not hold back when calling out Peyton for his horrible and sickening racist actions. She told him there was no space for him within society. There is no place for you or your ignorant, hateful, and evil ideologies in a civilized society. There can be no mercy for you, no understanding, no second chances. Peyton's actions were inexcusable, and there's nothing that he could ever do to make up for them. The damage you have caused is too great, and the people you have hurt are too valuable to this community. You will never see the light of day as a free man ever again. She finally said the words that everyone that was affected by this tragedy was waiting to hear. It is the judgment of this court for your conviction under the first count of the indictment, a domestic act of terrorism motivated by hate in the first degree, an A1 felony, that you be sentenced to life imprisonment without parole. 
His official sentence was 11 life sentences with no parole. Do you think that this is a fair sentence or do you believe that Peyton should have had to pay with his life for the horrible crimes he committed? Let us know in the comments. Death to the enemies of America. Leave this country if you hate our freedom. Tonight, the men accused of the horrific rampage on a Portland train, 35-year-old Jeremy Christian made a belligerent first appearance in court. In 2017, Jeremy Christian, a known white supremacist, was riding a train in Portland. He came across two young women. They were both black and one was wearing a hijab. He began screaming at them and going on a racist, anti-Muslim rant. They became uncomfortable and moved to a different area of the train. Several men came forward to try to defend the girls. They included Ricky John Best, Talison Madrid Mahiki Mech, and Micah David Cole Fletcher. They told Jeremy that he needed to get off the train. He refused. This led to a fight breaking out. Jeremy attacked the men, striking them with a weapon. Both Ricky and Talison would later die as a result of their injuries. Micah was rushed to the hospital and later recovered. After the attack, Jeremy got off the bus and disappeared into the crowd. Luckily, several people were able to identify him, and he was later arrested and charged with murder. Throughout his trial, Jeremy was often very disruptive and would often make outbursts and have to be removed from the courtroom. After he was convicted, Jeremy was given an opportunity to address the court before his sentencing. He could have tried to use this chance to apologize for his actions and possibly receive some sort of lesser sentence. Instead, he chose to insult the victims' families. I feel violent. People die. One of the girls who Jeremy insulted while on the train that day was also given an opportunity to speak in court. When she called him out for his actions, he jumped up, yanked his face mask off, and flew into yet another racist tirade and had to be removed from the courtroom. See you there. Yeah, okay. Go back to Tennessee, no. too. What do I tell you? Go back to Tennessee, too. We don't want you here. Oh, All you great I... I... You victim's family says they feel a sense of relief. Their focus now is spreading love. 40-year-old Russell Cortier teared up during today's hearing, but the victim's family believes it was all for show. The judge says he was driven by hate and anger when he ran over and killed Larnell Bruce in August of 2016. In August 2016, Larnell Bruce, a young black man, was just minding his own business when he was spotted by a white supremacist named Russell Courtier. Russell decided to target the 19-year-old simply because of the color of his skin. He purposefully ran his vehicle into Larnell and then drove away. The young man passed away from his injuries days later. Russell was arrested and charged with murder and a hate crime. He was convicted in March 2019 and sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole. His girlfriend, who was in the vehicle with him at the time of the murder, was charged with manslaughter and sentenced to 10 years behind bars for her role in this horrific tragedy. The victim's family met with us after the hearing surrounded by green balloons to promote organ donation. They say Bruce's organs help save five people. As for the man now sentenced to life in prison, they say they hope he realizes how much they all have lost. Question just between you and me. A bullet to that guy in the chest. Satisfactory. Sounds good. All right. What you just heard was a real conversation that was had between a hit man and a racist man named Thomas Driver. In March 2015, he, along with Charles Newcomb and David Morin, planned out a murder. All three of the men are racist and members of the KKK. They are also former prison guards. All of this started because Thomas got into a physical fight with a black inmate. He would later tell Charles and David that the inmate attempted to bite him, likely in an attempt to give him some sort of disease. Thomas was enraged and decided that he wanted to get revenge by killing the inmate. 
They later talked about their plan at a KKK meeting. What they didn't know was that their meeting had been infiltrated by someone undercover from law enforcement. The officer tricked them into thinking he was going to help them carry out the murder, but he ended up thwarting their plan entirely. They were arrested and charged with conspiracy to commit murder. Thomas took a plea deal which allowed him to be released after four years, but both Charles and David were convicted by a jury and sentenced to 10 years each. Do you think these were fair sentences? After all, had there not been an undercover law enforcement officer at that meeting, they might have been successful in their evil plot. Let us know in the comments. You may remember this picture from back over the summer. It shows a man who claims to be the president of the Virginia KKK driving his car into a group of Black Lives Matter protesters in Henrico. Today, he was sentenced for the crime. Harry Rogers hated black people for no reason and actively went out of his way to hurt them. He is the former head of the Virginia chapter of the KKK. His dream was to be as famous as other members of the KKK from years past. In 2020, when Black Lives Matter rallies were occurring across the United States, Harry's hatred and anger towards black people reached a boiling point. With a child in the vehicle with him, he went to an area where some black people were protesting and proceeded to drive his truck through the group with the intention of killing as many as possible. He then drove away. While his actions thankfully did not claim any lives, several people were injured in this racist attack. He was later arrested and faced with a slew of charges, including assault and hit and run. He eventually pleaded guilty. While in court, Harry apologized for his actions and also asked the judge to consider that he did have children that he missed and wanted to see again. The defense asked the court to consider restorative justice, saying Rogers is willing to sit down with the protesters and talk. I think because of the particularities of this case, I don't know if the victims in this case believe uh, the defendant when he made that statement. Harry received just three years behind bars. Do you think Harry is actually sorry for what he did, or is it possible he was just saying whatever he thought the judge wanted to hear in order to get less jail time? Is three years enough time for someone who committed what many may consider attempted murder? Let us know in the comments. Each one of these racist people could have kept their hate to themselves, or they could have chosen not to hate in the first place. They could have educated themselves about tolerance. Instead, they chose to act out on their racist beliefs and each one of them paid the price. Each of these stories should prove to any other people thinking about doing similar things that they will get caught and they will have to pay a price. Thanks for watching and don't forget to like and subscribe for more.